Hello, everybody. I am Jeff Wade. I am the lead pastor of First Assembly of God here in Ocala, Florida. And I'm very glad that you are with me for our Wednesday School of the Bible. We have uh, been taking some time to walk through the Old Testament and just trying to lay out some of the history and the events and studying the books of the Bible there and, and trying to kind of put them in place so when we go to the Old Testament, we can better understand some of the history and some of the things that are going on. If you've been with me over the last several weeks, you uh, know that uh, we have looked at a time here in First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, we've been kind of stuck in those four books for a little while because some of the most important history uh, related to the Old Testament comes from those books. Uh, the big event that takes place in these books is the split of Israel. They literally become two different nations after the reign of Solomon. And we've learned that it ended up that there's the northern part of Israel uh, it will be referred to as Israel, ends up being led away by a guy named Jeroboam who becomes the king of that country. And then the southern part, which is the tribe of Judah, and they will have their capital in, in the city of Jerusalem, uh, is going to be led by a descendant of David and then Solomon, and his name is going to be Rehoboam. And Rehoboam is going to be part of this lineage of David that will extend until Israel is going to come to, or Judah will come to an end, this kingdom. Uh, we've looked so far last week at the kings of Israel, and we kind of late talked about them one at a time. And one of the things we learned last week is, is that Israel had a lot of kings in their 209 years that they existed, and that to become a king in Israel, uh, all you had to do was kill the guy before you. There were a lot of assassinations that took place in the lines. Uh, this is going to be a little different for Judah because this is going to be an uninterrupted dynasty that extends from David and will continue on. God had promised David that there would be somebody sitting on the throne of Israel or uh, of Judah. And so this is exactly what's going to happen. And so there's a little peace. But uh, one thing we saw last week, there were a lot of crummy kings that's going to rule Israel. And it's going to be no different for Judah there's some really good kings that are going to stand out, but there's quite a few characters who were truly bad guys. I don't think we'll get through all of them today, but I'd like to start out and just kind of go through the time of the Assyrian domination of the region so we can kind of put everything into place. And so uh, we talked a little bit already about Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, who is left with just a small part of the kingdom, and he ends up being pretty wicked king. Uh, Solomon had started some worship of foreign gods and goddesses in his land. And uh, so Rehoboam just kind of continues in that. Uh, he ends up much of his kingship fighting with Israel, trying to get him back. He passes away and his son Abjiah uh, becomes king. And he is no better than Rehoboam. He's going to continue the idolatry uh, that his dad was involved in. Uh, his mother is going to be kind of a key player in influencing him in a lot of negative ways. She's going to put up a, 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 a shrine to the goddess Asherah. Uh, there's going to be a lot of times during Abj Abjaya's uh, reign that he is going to be fighting with Israel. And so Judah and Israel throughout his reign is going to continue during this time. He's going to pass away, and his son Asa is going to come to the throne. And finally, it looks like after Rehoboam and Abjiah that things are going to get better because Asa is a, is a pretty good king. And uh, he starts a number of religious reforms that are going to be very powerful for the nation, uh, calling people back to God. Ten years, he is going to do incredible. And things are going to go so good during his reign that godly people that live in Israel are going to hear that there's someone with a heart for God that's, that's leading Judah. And what happens is uh, Israel at this point are already, is already wrapped in all kinds of idolatry and, and, and following all kinds of idols and turned their back on God. And so there are Jewish people there who still have a heart to worship God, Yahweh. And so they end up starting to kind of drift and become immigrants out of Israel and move down into Judah. 
and it's going pretty good for a while. There's a slow drain that's going on, and there ends up being more and more people that are leaving Israel to go down to Judah, and all of a sudden, the king of, of Israel is going to get very je jealous, and uh, he is not going to like these people coming down to King Asa, and so he starts kind of a war uh, with Judah, and he's going to stop this from happening, and so it ends up that Asa, instead of trusting God and believing that God would help him, he ends up deciding that he is afraid of Basha, the king that starts this war, and he ends up going and getting a bunch of the gold and the silver and buying off the Syrians in his panic. And by doing this, he fails God because God would have taken care of him. God wanted to help him, but he had to go with his own solution. Boy, don't we do that so often. There's things we should be trusting God on, but we go and invest in a lot of things that kind of take us away from God. We waste a lot of the blessings that God's given us. And, and this ends up being something that Asa ends up being condemned for. So Asaph's first 10 years, really good serving God, but then he allows panic, he allows fear uh, to turn him away from God and to cause his heart to grow cold. He passes away and his son, uh, probably our favorite name of a king of, of Judah, uh, comes about Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat, maybe you've heard of him, maybe you remember his name, reigns for 25 years. And like his dad, Asa, he is going to bring a lot of spiritual reforms into the land. He's going to do a lot of very positive things. He's got a lot of spiritual zeal. He's, he's excited about serving God and, and following after God. And so he's restoring the temple. He's, he's, he's leading people to, to turn away from these foreign gods and goddesses. But it ends up in his life that as he starts facing challenges, that he sometimes has difficulty in trusting God. And this is going to become one of the things. And, you know, it's, it's a reminder to us that, that we can be going to church, we can be doing all of these things and say all the right things, but we still have got to make sure that our heart and our trust is direct linkly to, uh, directly linked to God. And so that's going to be so very important. He, Jehoshaphat's also going to have another problem, and that is, is that he has got a real heart not to be fighting with Israel, but the fact that they're Jewish and that the people of Judah are Jewish, he wants them to be in harmony together. And so he starts to try to accommodate them, and he's going to try to make peace with them, and he will make peace with them. And the only problem is, if you remember last week, we talked about the worst king that's going to rule Israel, and we said that it was a man named Ahab and his wife Jezebel. Well, guess who Jehoshaphat is linking himself with, with this idea of I've got to be at peace with them, and, and I've got to make sure, well, it ends up being Ahab, who requires sometimes to make peace uh, and to accommodate people, we're going to have to compromise. And it's important sometimes that we're willing to humble ourselves, and because sometimes our pride and our arrogance is in the way of us being in harmony. God wants us to be in harmony, but when it requires that, that we're going to compromise our Christian values and principles to make other people happy and to like us, it's not worth the cost. Well, Jehoshaphat is a person who, unfortunately, is going to make some bad choices in trying to accommodate Israel and to make them happy. He's going to put himself in some bad situations, and it's going to be something that's going to end up tainting his kingship during these 25 years. Mostly good, but this desire to compromise and to be linked and, and this problem and sometimes trusting God is going to end up being some things that's going to put a little bit of a taint over his reign and, and his time over the nation of Judah. This takes us to the next 80 years, and I won't get into the history of all the kings that come up and a queen that's going to come up, but I'll say that for the most part, the next 80 years is filled by kings who are going to be corrupt. They're going to be weak. Uh, they're going to be a lot of, there's going to be a lot of compromise. We're going to run into names like Jehoram and uh, Ahaziah and Am Amariah. Uh, there's going to be a queen named Attila, uh, who is going to be the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel, who's going to end up, she married one of the kings and and after he dies, she kind of takes over and, and brings her own special uh, wickedness. In the midst of this is a guy named Joash, uh, who is a pretty decent king. But even in his reign, there's going to be corruption and some problems. 
And so these 80 years are not going to be real bright years uh, for the nation of Judah, but there's going to end up being a good guy that shows up after the 80 years and these weak kings that, that have so much corruption. And this guy's going to get a long time to rule over the nation. And he's going to do a lot of things because he has a good start and he has a true heart for God. And he's going to reign for these 52 years. And it's going to be a time of great prosperity for the nation. They're going to do very well. He's even going to do something that hasn't been done before this. Everybody else has lost land, lost territory. But Uzziah, the king of these 52 years, is going to actually expand, is, is going to actually expand Judah. He's going to be viewed very favorably. But he's going to end up at the end of his reign by becoming very prideful and becoming arrogant. And it's a reminder sometimes because of our obedience, God blesses us. And so often we'll see people who start out very well with a heart for God and, and especially in ministry sometimes. And God will really honor that heart. And they start young and, and they're serving God and they're being obedient and they're walking according to the word of God. But as God begins to bless you know, every blessing God gives, there's some temptation with the blessings. Are we going to continue to look at God, or are we going to look at our blessings? Well, Uzziah, unfortunately, begins to look at his blessings and, and gets a little too full of himself, and it leads to pride, which ends up causing him to kind of turn away from God, and, and he ends up with leprosy. Despite that, he still, because of some of the other kings, is remembered quite fondly. Uh, by the people of Judah. You may remember reading uh, the book of Isaiah, and you'll remember Isaiah's call in Isaiah chapter 6. And he starts out by saying, in the year that King Uzziah died. And uh, he speaks about the call that he had, and there's a sense in the way he says it, in the way he marks uh, Judah's history, that he's quite sad at what's happened. He's quite disappointed in, in the death of Uzziah. He sees this as a, as a bad place for the nation, and so he ends up seeing God. And this is about the time that Isaiah is going to be commissioned uh, to become a prophet and, and to start following after God. But Uzziah dies, and Isaiah becomes a prophet, and the son of Uzziah follows him. And fortunately for the nation, he has a heart for God, and his name's Jotham. And Jotham's going to reign for 16 years, and he's going to be a very good king. He's going to make a lot of good decisions. He's going to bring, continue to bring some religious reforms, turning people to God. And he ends up serving at kind of the highest point. His dad had, had brought it to kind of this golden time that things are going to be really good. And during his son Jotham's reign, it gets even better. And so the people are fairly prosperous. The nation's doing very well. Everything looks good. And Jotham, after his 16 years, passes away and there's going to be a problem because the nation has done so well and it looks so good and it's at a place, it's a fairly small nation, it is at a place and a time that there ends up being a force that is going to be threatening this nation and it's going to be quite attractive to the Assyrians. And we talked a little bit about the Assyrians last week. The Assyrians stand out as some of the most cruel and violent people in history. It, it, it's terrible, the, the accounts of stuff that they would do as they would come into towns. They, they were the original kind of barbarians and, and just horrible stories of, of what they would do. And I won't even get into all of it, but it, it, it's pretty bad. And so Jotham passes away. He leaves a nation that's quite wealthy and the Assyrians take notice. And his son becomes king, and if there was anybody that should not have been the king during a time of national threat and jeopardy, when the empire that's, that's a little ways off is wanting to invade you and take everything, his son Ahaz is definitely the guy that should not have been there. Ahaz turns out to be one of the worst kings in the history of Judah. And he is going to do some horrible and terrible things. He turns his back completely on God. One of the things God had made clear from the very beginning was that there was to be no human sacrifices ever. God's the giver of life. 
and human life is precious to him. Every human is created in, in the image of God and is important to him. And so this life that God gives us is valued. It's, it's sacred. So what does Ahaz do? Well, he's trying to get the favor of other gods. He takes his son and sacrifices his son to a foreign god. So he kills his son to try to get favor from, from a foreign god. He ends up being invaded by a coalition of nations led by Israel and, and Syria and several others. And they're not really able to get very far. They're kind of being held back. And Isaiah comes to him and tells him, Ahaz, you need to do what I'm going to tell you to do. You need to follow my direction. You need to turn to God. And Ahaz refuses to listen to Isaiah. And instead, what he does is he ends up taking all the gold and silver from the temple. He strips all the walls, all the sacred objects. He gets them, and he sends them off to Assyria. And he says to the Assyrians, I want you to come and help me. And so instead of trusting God, he trusts the Assyrians, and he gives the wealth of his nation to them to come and, and bring his deliverance. And it ends up being something that works for him, but it ends up being very costly. He loses a lot of territory. Uh, it was at this time, uh, thanks to Ahaz, that the Assyrians are going to come and they're going to invade Samaria, which is the capital city of Israel. And he is the one who kind of invites them in. And, and it's the Assyrians, uh, through Ahaz's invitation, comes and wipes out all of Israel and completely loots it, completely destroys it, wipes it out of existence. Those 10 tribes of Israel disappear forever, thanks to Ahaz and, and all his wonderful kingship and leadership and refusal to hear from God. And so we, we see that Israel comes to an end at this point, and it ends up that Judah is not destroyed by Assyria, but they become kind of a puppet state to, to uh, Judah or to Assyria. And it ends up that Ahaz, whatever tune Assyria plays, he's going to do. He even goes to the capital, to Nineveh, and he sees this altar there to a foreign god, and uh, the one that they worship. And so he gets all the measurements, he gets the blueprints of it, and he sends them back to Jerusalem. And he says, I want this altar to this foreign god to be built. And he actually moves the altar that's in the temple out of the way and places this altar to this foreign god there in the temple. And we know that's something that, that definitely should never be done. And so he will be remembered as probably the worst king of Judah because of all the territory he's going to lose, all the wealth that he ends up giving away. The people are kind of glad when the guy dies and he goes on and he puts the nation in a terrible, messed up, horrible kind of situation and place. And this leads to his son, who's going to come in and, and be king for 29 years. And fortunately for the nation, his son is not going to be like him. His son is going to be one of the truly good guys who's going to be very successful. His son's name is going to be Hezekiah, and he is going to lead in spiritual reforms. And one of the key things that Hezekiah does, his dad had gone and embraced the Assyrians and all that they did, but Hezekiah can't stand the Assyrians. He can't stand their, their paganism, their, their arrogance, their, their shaking their fist at God. And so Hezekiah pushes them away, which really makes the Assyrians mad. And so twice during his reign, the Assyrians are going to be invading Judah, coming to crush him. Twice, God is going to give a miraculous deliverance to the nation of Judah because of Hezekiah's heart and Hezekiah's desire to serve God. And isn't it wonderful to be reminded that as we're willing to serve God, as we're willing to follow him, God will take care of us. And Hezekiah kind of stands as a proof of that. And it said in 2 Kings 18, 5, speaking of Hezekiah, it says, he trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him. And so what a great tribute that's being given to Hezekiah for those 29 years and his contribution. And he proves to us that even when there's been bad before us and there's bad around us, that it's possible for us to serve God. 
And we all have a choice that we have to make. These kings are certainly good examples of people who made right choices, people who made wrong choices, people who were doing good things and got led astray, people who were doing bad things and got brought back to the right place. And I just wanted to close out with a passage from Isaiah chapter 7. And this is an example of the, the time that, that the dad of Hezekiah Ahaz was making this bad choice and what Isaiah went and said to him during this time. Isaiah chapter 7, starting in verse 1, it says, In the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Ramaliah, the king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not yet mount an attack against it. When the house of David was told Syria is in league with Ephraim, the heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. And so there's, we've talked a little bit about books of poetry and the prophets speaking in poetry. And so there's some poetic imagery. And the Lord said to Isaiah, go out and meet Ahaz, you and Shir Jashba, that's your son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pole on the highway to the washer's field and say to him, be careful, be quiet, do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint because of those two smoldering stumps of firebrands at the fierce anger of Rezin in Syria and the son of Ramaliah, because Syria with Ephraim and the son of Ramaliah has devised evil against you, saying, let us go up against Judah and terrify it and let us conquer it for ourselves and set up the son of Tabil as king in the midst of it. Thus says the Lord God. And so he's saying, don't be afraid. Ahaz, I'm going to deliver you. And, and, and so this is what Isaiah says to Ahaz. It shall not stand, and it shall not come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is risen. And within 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered from being a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Ramaliah. If you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. So here is a choice that Ahaz is going to have spoken from the lips of the prophet Isaiah, trust in God, I'm going to take care of these nations. And what does he end up doing? He ends up instead relying on what he thinks is best and ignoring the word of God. He's a reminder to us that we have a choice. We may not be king of a nation, but we can be the people of God. But we have to make the choice. Do we trust God or do we trust what seems right to us? God will do so much for us, but it requires that choice to be following him. And I want to encourage you today as I'm finishing up this study for today that you make sure that God is leading your life, that you have placed your life into his hands, and that you are willing to follow him and do as he is leading you to do, not what seems right in your own eyes, but what he is calling you to. And so I'd like to close in prayer, and I want to say if you're not a Christian today, if you've been going your own way, doing your own thing, if you will pray with me right now and ask God to forgive you of your sins, this can be a good new start and a new beginning. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the stories that you give us that are there to encourage us and to show us the way. Well, we see a lot of men today who made bad choices and a woman who made bad choices, but we also see people who did the right thing. And it's a reminder, it's not about the times that we live in, but about the choices we make about whether or not we are going to serve you and we are going to follow you. Help us to be like these godly leaders, these godly kings who did it right, people who are going to trust you, who are going to believe you. Lord, even Ahaz, as bad a king as he was, as, as, as many dumb things as he did and, and all the damage he did to the nation, there was an opportunity for him to trust you. If there's anybody today who's praying with me that's maybe they've made mistakes, may they recognize that you are calling them to a new life. May this be the time of their salvation, their day to say, I'm walking away from my old life and I'm going to start living for Jesus Christ. And Lord, as they do that, may they just have an assurance that, that you are with them and that you are going to help them and you are going to guide them. And I'll just thank you, Lord, for your blessing and your work in your name, Jesus. Amen. And amen. May God bless you today. If you prayed that prayer with me and, and you have become a Christian today, I'd like to send you some information on some good next steps. 
of what you can do as a new believer if you'll just send me an email to Pastor Wade at ocalafirst.org. I will be sure to send you some information that will, will be a great way for you to make a new start in, in following after Christ. If you've got a prayer request, there's something going on in your life, you'd like to have our prayer teams here at Ocala First pray for you. Send a prayer request to Pastor Wade at ocalafirst.org, and I will have our prayer teams praying for you. May God bless you today. I hope that you have a good rest of your week.